I'm a physician specialised in rheumatology and I have interests in a variety of different rheumatic diseases, both at a research level and in terms of clinical practice. In particular, I have an interest in osteoarthritis and osteoarthritis-like conditions uh, and hemochromatosis and the arthropathy associated with that falls into that category fair and square. I also have an interest in the basic research and the development of new treatments for rheumatic diseases. It's a type of arthritis that hasn't been recognised and understood for that long was discovered as an independent type of arthritis in the 1960s, but it's taken a long time to really get some understanding of what it is and why it occurs, and we've still got a long way to go. It's an arthritis that doesn't affect everybody with hemochromatosis, but it probably affects at least a quarter. And why that quarter and not the other three quarters, we don't really know. But the extent of the iron overload is probably one important factor in that regard. So the more iron overload there is, or the later it's discovered, the more likely it is that an arthritis will develop or will have already developed. And it tends to be progressive, unfortunately, so that over time there will be more damage to the joints. And that's despite all our efforts to try and restrict that or retard that progression. Unfortunately, the arthritis seems more resistant to treatment than practically every other manifestation of the disease. So if we can unload the excess iron, we see significant improvements in regard to effects on the liver, uh, diabetes, the heart, general symptoms like fatigue, tummy pain, but we don't see big improvements. In fact, it's doubtful that we see very much improvement overall in the joints. And why that is so is still an enigma, and how to address it is still held back to a large degree because of that limited understanding that we have of why this has developed in the first place and how to tackle it. A fellow called Sheldon did some fairly important work on the basis of the condition in the 1930s. So you could say really less than 100 years. His work demonstrated that uh, there was substantial deposition of the iron in tissues that are vulnerable in this disease. And that is doubtless very important in terms of why certain organs malfunction. Uh, when the iron overload develops. And he noticed also that it was present in joint tissues, uh, but it really wasn't picked up on for quite a long time afterwards. So we know a fair amount about the basis of the disease overall, uh, how the genetics play an important part, and how uh, the accumulation of iron is a crucial part of the process and what happens when we try and interfere with that process to achieve a better outcome. But there are still niche areas, if you like, uh, of which arthritis is very much one, where we're limited in terms of our understanding of what goes on. I have a hunch that there's some trapping of the iron in joint tissues that doesn't occur in other tissues. So it doesn't seem to be trapped in the liver and if you bleed people regularly, the iron goes down in the liver. My suspicion is that it probably doesn't go down in the joint tissues. It's not as easy to get hold of those tissues to examine them regularly, but it would seem as if there is retention of the iron. It's a one-way process, perhaps, whereby it can get in, but it can't so easily get out. And we know that it's still there because people who eventually wind up needing a hip replacement or a knee replacement, for example, uh, have tissue removed at the time of the operation.
And when you examine that tissue, there's plenty of iron still there, even though they might have had 50 or 100 bleeds to get rid of that iron over the years. So it would, it would seem that it just hasn't paid off. Quite why is a tantalising question. And I think if we knew the answer, we might have a far better chance of being able to interfere helpfully, if you like, and arrest or restrict the process so that there would not be the outcomes that we see at present. Some joints are the same joints that seem to be involved in osteoarthritis, so hips and knees, occasionally elbows and shoulders, but small joints as well, and the knuckle joints can be involved, and they have a typical pattern that enables us to sometimes pick up the likelihood that hemochromatosis is present. But overall, we struggle just on the basis of examination and imaging to know for sure that it is hemochromatosis. So the diagnosis of arthritis attributable to hemochromatosis becomes one of context um, and clues and making an overall judgment rather than proof beyond all doubt based on a blood test or based on an image. Strangely, it will show itself sometimes many years before the hemochromatosis is diagnosed. So a 10 year or even 20 year um, lead time is occasionally observed. And, and very often in that situation, even though in retrospect, you can identify it as the arthritis that typically associates with hemochromatosis, prospectively, it's often not recognized as such. And it's only when later on some other symptoms begin to develop that the penny drops and the relevant blood tests and genetic tests are done and the diagnosis is made. But it can be later than the diagnosis. We don't really have a, a good understanding of why it can predate and why it can post-date diagnosis. Um, but there doesn't seem to be a consistent time unfortunately, so we're, we're left having to be alert. We think about a quarter based on the studies that we did of communities with hemochromatosis in Perth, but others have described it you know, in as few as 13%, as many as 81%. I think one of the difficulties with a lot of the studies that have been done is that they've been questionnaire-based, and so there's been very little opportunity to discriminate between other types of arthritis and that which is linked with hemochromatosis. And even when it's been done in a clinical setting where there's been an examination, it hasn't always been possible to differentiate between osteoarthritis, which is really common in the population, and in the age groups where uh, hemochromatosis is often diagnosed, so difficult to discriminate between that common form of population-based form of arthritis and that form of arthritis that is linked with or attributable to hemochromatosis. So I think probably overestimates have occurred in the studies that have been done. I would think it's probably more like around about the 25% mark based on our studies and also taking into account that tendency to overestimate in questionnaires. We certainly pursue vigorously the correction of the iron overload, even though, as I mentioned earlier, we don't have that confidence that it really makes a lot of difference. And one reason for that is possibly because there's already been some damage to the joints, and we know that that's very difficult to address, except surgically in general. And it's very similar to osteoarthritis in a hip, where once it's worn, symptoms are occurring, you can't easily use a medicine to overcome that process and it tends to be resistant to the medicines in general. So that's, that's one approach that we take. We still nevertheless will try and correct the iron levels optimally and that pays off for all the other manifestations of the disease and so it's crucial that that be done. And in addition, in terms of the joints themselves, we then apply pretty much empirical treatment. So we will use the same kinds of treatments that we use for 
osteoarthritis, and that might, for example, include uh, medicines, physical approaches, uh, and surgery. And it very much depends on the stage that it is at. But in terms of the physical things, we would be keen to keep people active, mobile, um, stress the importance of strengthening muscles around joints so that they don't become unstable and wear more rapidly. Uh, medicines, generally symptomatic treatments to alleviate pain, improve mobility. Anti-inflammatories are a good option for that, although they aren't a perfect option by a long stretch and they do have risks. And we're increasingly trying to circumvent those risks by moving more where we can towards topical therapies and injection therapies, which pay off to a certain extent, probably pay off more with the arthritis associated with hemochromatosis. But they still leave a significant gap in terms of how many and how severe the residual symptoms tend to be. I think if you compare them, for example, to a group of patients like those with gout, where in a way there's an analogy because in gout there's a build-up of, of uric acid in our bodies and that gets deposited in the joints. But unlike in hemochromatosis, we can get it out by correcting that imbalance that leads to its formation in the first place. So it dissolves away and over time the gouty joint goes back to being a, an almost normal joint, particularly if there hasn't been any structural damage to that joint. But in the hemochromatotic situation, we can't achieve that, as I mentioned, probably because there's some trapping going on and we can't reverse it. Uh, but, but there are those similarities. Because we can't reverse it, because we can't overcome those symptoms, the big challenge is how to function, how to manage, how to live life in a comfortable way, despite the fact that we haven't been successful in eliminating this arthritis or treating it so that all the symptoms go away. And I think that that uh, is a, a challenge that for some is more manageable than it is for others. And like in most things in medicine and most diseases, there's a spectrum and some are unfortunate and have much more severe disease and others are fortunate and have mild disease or disease that isn't going to progress as rapidly and do as much damage and so they fare better. For those who have got the more severe forms of the disease, I think the challenge is really how to get the most out of what medicines there are, how to, to improve one's mobility despite the fact that this arthritis is still there and not going away, how to find ways to exercise without aggravating it. So lots of challenges really, and I think many people have a potential role in terms of contributing to um, facilitating some degree of success in that regard. And, and Definitely family doctors have a role in that respect. Uh, specialists have a role, physiotherapists have a role. So there's, there's scope for a number of different people to be able to contribute. And I think the tendency sometimes is to overlook the possibility of surgery until very late in the day when uh, the symptoms have become just about unbearable or unmanageable or Mobility has declined to the point where people are questioning whether it's worth living like this any longer. And that's possibly to, uh, overcome to some extent by getting more expert surgical advice earlier to determine whether this is something that can be addressed or not. Uh, there's increasingly uh, opportunities to do more limited procedures at earlier stages so that one doesn't have to then come to the more definitive total replacement of the joint until a little bit later. The people that I see are usually people in whom musculoskeletal symptoms have developed. It may be the case that they have been attributed to arthritis associated with hemochromatosis or they just might be experiencing aches and pains and have no clear idea what that means and whether that's part of the hemochromatosis or whether it's something totally different. So I think they are keen to have some clarity about the diagnosis 
and then some understanding of what can be done to address that. And also there's interest in if this is part of the hemochromatosis, how likely is it that my children and my grandchildren might develop the same disease and the same manifestations of it that I'm experiencing? And can you do anything to prevent that from happening? So there's often a few questions that are in the mind of the person that comes along. And most of those depend greatly on being sure about what's going on. So I generally start by trying to get a clear picture of what's happening in terms of symptoms, examine people to determine whether they do have arthritis in joints that would fit with hemochromatosis, and if not, then that might fit with something else. And once the diagnosis is established, then you can address some of those questions more helpfully in terms of what treatments are available and what the implications might be genetically. I think there's been a lot that has happened in terms of hemochromatosis and medical research in general, and, and we are benefiting from that and being in a position to pick up on advances that are occurring elsewhere. Some of that has implications for the arthritis, uh, not as much as we'd like, uh, but some of it does, and it's opening up some new opportunities. To give you one example in that respect, there's uh, been a considerable amount of research that has been done looking at why there might be excessive uh, absorption of iron in the first place. And a liver protein has been identified that is called hepcidin, which has a key role in facilitating that process and regulating iron metabolism in general in the body. So researchers are now making analogues or derivatives of that protein to see if they can manipulate the process overall. I think that's going to pay off in terms of being able to achieve better results than we can achieve now by bloodletting. And that could pay off in terms of the joints since it may be an agent that could be exploited to stop this trapping phenomenon from occurring, for example. Like a lot of research, sometimes there are spin-offs that you just don't foresee. It wasn't part of the plan when the research was conceived and undertaken in the first place. But once a discovery is made, then people begin to explore its applications. And sometimes a totally unforeseen possibility emerges and you can undertake a study and discover a further application of that protein or that uh, derivative of a protein that then has uh, the potential to change things, sometimes quite significantly. So I think all of these developments are really encouraging. I think they're opening up possibilities that we didn't foresee. And whilst it's not possible to be predictive and say this will work or this will change what's going on now, there's that potential. I think I can be positive and encouraging in terms of possibilities that are on the horizon, but I think that there are going to be yet more that we haven't yet really appreciated that will come along. And given the rate of change that has been evident in the last 10 to 20 years, it wouldn't be unreasonable to predict that there are going to be some really important and major discoveries that will have significant impact in the next 10 to 20 years and maybe even sooner. Oftentimes these things accelerate. So I, I would be inclined to give a more positive picture of what the future may hold. In terms of the concerns that there might be about family members, because this is a disease that is a form of dysregulation, if you like, or a situation in which there's just something that's out of balance, I think we've got much more scope to be able to crack the nut, if you like, in terms of working out ways in which we can correct that process, as opposed to other more difficult 
nuts to crack, like cancer, for example, where there seem to be a multitude of pathways and many genetic abnormalities and changes in cancer cells that are really difficult to understand and correct. But even there, important advances are occurring. But I think that this is a simpler problem in terms of uh, the processes that appear to be at play and ought therefore be amenable to correction more readily. And so I think that's a positive. Hemochromatosis Australia has a website called ha.org.au and there is information available on the website for anyone interested in hemochromatosis. So general practitioners, um, allied health personnel, uh, patients, family members, and there's also an information line, an info line, a 1300 number, so 1300 019 028. So either of those sources would be excellent.